While he's doing that, I'll promise you he'll give you a copy of that, by the way. You don't have to remember all of those instructions. My name is William Brown. I'm the Deputy District Attorney of Dane County. Yesterday you met Andrea Raymond. Together we're the prosecutors in the case. Uh, you heard a little bit about how the process worked in jury selection, and you probably thought you were being strung along the whole time, and, and in a bit you were. Uh, everyone was trying to gauge your knowledge of the case, maybe any preconceived notions you had about the criminal justice system. Uh, Ms. Vera asked you a lot of questions about what you would think if she did nothing and sat there, and, and those were good questions. Um, I won't do nothing in this case because it would be a very short trial if I did. Uh, you're going to hear uh, from me, Ms. Raymond, quite a bit. Our job in a case is to present evidence. That means to call witnesses. The judge talked about what evidence is. We think of evidence, sometimes we think of, especially a murder case, you're in a murder case, you think of the gun. And you'll get that. There'll be a gun. You'll see that. But evidence is so much more. The first thing evidence is, is the first thing the judge mentioned. Evidence is first the sworn testimony of witnesses, both on direct and cross-examination. When people raise their right hand and they swear to tell the truth, that's evidence. Now you as jurors can decide whether you believe it or not. Does this person have any bias or prejudice? Do they have anything to gain by what they're saying? Do they have anything to lose? All those things are up to you. But sworn testimony is evidence. Photographs are evidence, videos are evidence. Statements made by people involved in the case, including Mr. Halderson, are evidence. Our job is to, over the course of the next couple of weeks, present evidence to show you the path of what we believe happened, which is that Chandler Halderson killed his parents, dismembered their bodies, and hid them around southern Wisconsin. I've been talking about Bart and Krista Halderson. You've heard their names mentioned numerous times by the judges here. That's Bart and Krista Halderson. I'm going to try to use some photos as I talk to maybe guide us along. Some people are more visual learners, some aren't. That's Bart and Krista Halderson, a couple in their early 50s, living in Windsor, Wisconsin, in a quiet street, in a quiet house, and in a quiet town. If you don't know Windsor, think just south of DeForest. Maybe if you're heading up toward the Dells, when you see the Fleet Farm on your left, if you looked right, that's Windsor. That's the Halderson home. At this point, perhaps it would be best if I told you a little bit about the Halderson family. Bart, the father, Krista, the mother. They have two sons, Chandler, the defendant, and his older, older brother, Mitchell. Chandler and Mitchell are close in age, but Mitchell's a little bit older. The time this all happened, living in the Halderson home, was Bart Halderson, Krista Halderson, and Chandler. Mitchell had moved out. Mitchell had a job working as an IT person for a local corporation, doing pretty well in life. He's engaged, doing pretty well in life. Buying a house, adult things, growing up. But in July of 2021, it's Bart and Krista, living in that house, and their adult 23-year-old son, Chandler Halverson, living in his room. Now, all of the events I'm going to describe, for the most part, take place during the first week of July, from the 1st to about the 8th. So I put up a calendar. This is not evidence in the case, I suppose. It might be. Maybe I'll mark it as an exhibit. But it's to provide some reference, and I put the little flag on there, because if you remember this year, the 4th of July was on a Sunday. Everyone celebrated, of course, all weekend. A lot of places celebrated on Saturday. But the 4th of July was on a Sunday. Now, I'm giving my opening statement. The judge told you opening statements aren't evidence. And in fact, that's the reason you don't have notebooks. I'd like to think so it's you have to pay attention to me, but that's not true. It's because nothing I say is evidence. So as I say things up here, what I'm saying is what I expect to prove in the next couple of weeks. But what I expect to prove beyond any reasonable doubt is that on July 1st, 2021, somewhere between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m., Chandler Halderson murdered his parents. It's an important date, and it's an important time to remember. July 1st, between 3 and 5. But the story doesn't start there. 
And this trial wouldn't be three to four weeks if the trial ended there. The story starts a week later, on July 7th, 2021, nearly a week after killing his parents, but no one in the world knowing. Chandler Halderson walks into the Northeast Precinct of the Dane County Sheriff's Office and says, I'd like to file a missing persons report. He sits down with sheriff's deputies, and you'll meet them today, and he gives a long story. My parents, they just haven't come back from the cabin. They were there this weekend. We have a cabin up north. It's in White Lake, up in Lang Lake County. It's pretty far up north, a couple of hours. They just haven't come back yet. They were gonna come back Monday or Tuesday, and I don't know where they are. Who were they with, the deputies ask. I don't know. I helped them pack Thursday night. They must have left Friday early before I woke up at six. Who'd they go with? I don't know. Where are their cars? Well, they're still at the house. What'd you help them pack? Bottles of liquor, lots of money, tools, silver bars. Why were they going up there? Some people get, they were fixing a window. Some people got, it was a plumbing issue, storm damage. The story varied. Sometimes they took just money. Sometimes they took just liquor. But over that day and the next, I'm talking to numerous sheriff's deputies, detectives, including those detectives, he gives this bizarre story of his parents leaving in an unknown car, going to a cabin with an unknown couple, with an unknown amount of money, for really an unknown reason. So sheriff's deputies do what cops do, which is they ask him, have you heard from him? And he says, yeah, I got a text from my mom. And he did. He showed him his phone, made it safely. This is from Crystal Halderson to Chaz. That's what his family calls him, not Chandler. They call him Chaz. Made it safely. Can't get anything through, though. Yes, it's packed. Going to White Lake today for the parade. We'll be home Monday night, Tuesday early. I love you lots. So at this point, the sheriff's deputies don't know what they're dealing with. These folks get up there and decide, now ah, we're going to go to the casino for a few days. We're going to play hooky. Didn't make a lot of sense. They started talking to coworkers and realized these people had never no call, no showed, missed work, which they both did on Friday. Did they crash their car? Did this other couple kidnap them? Where the hell are they? But what good police do, and what they did in this case, is they start looking into the people who saw them last, who were with them last, who reported them missing. And in this case, all three of those things, the person who purportedly saw them last, was with them last, and reported them missing were the same person. It was Chandler Halderson. So what the police did, started to look into Chandler Halderson. Now, this is all occurring in the same 24-hour, 48-hour period. And what they learn about him isn't suspicious at all. He's a Madison College student, MATC. They go by Madison College now, if you didn't get the email. Madison College student. He's about to graduate. He's studying renewable resource engineering, kind of a hybrid IT degree with solar panels, things of that sort. He's about to get a certificate. But things had looked bright for him. He'd recently been working at American Family Insurance. He's working from home, like most of us, the last couple of years. But he's working a good job at American Family Insurance. And not only was he working a good job, Chandler had just gotten a better job. He got hired at SpaceX. He was about to embark on a career that people in the IT field could only dream of. He's planning to move to Titusville, Florida. That's where SpaceX operation is down in Florida with his girlfriend. They'd rented an apartment. They'd bought a car. And not only was this not someone who was antisocial, he was pro-social. He was working with the Madison police and the Department of Natural Resources on their rescue diving team. He was a scuba diver, working with the police. The only thing that was a bit odd is he'd recently suffered a head injury. He'd fallen down the stairs, had terrible concussion, 
was in, unable to move for the most part, had to wear a neck brace. He was permanently, perhaps, injured. All of those things threw police off from thinking it was Chandler. He had anything to do with this. And at that point, for all they knew, as sad as it is, Bart and Krista and an unknown couple were crashed into a ditch somewhere between here and White Lake, Wisconsin, dead from a car crash. So they started looking. Deputies are sent up north. The Langlade County Sheriff's Department is searching a cabin. No one had ever been there. It didn't look like anyone had been there at all in years. It was run down. The grass hadn't been mowed. There was no food in the refrigerator. No one had been there. So the police expand their search, and they start talking to not only just Chandler, people about Chandler. They start talking to people who were with Chandler that weekend. Specifically, they talked to his girlfriend, a young girl named Catherine. She goes by Cat. And Cat says, I was with him like all weekend. We had a normal Fourth of July weekend. We went out to my family's farm. We got a farm. There was a pool. We ate dinner. Chandler was having the concussion issue, and he couldn't really move his legs, and so he asked to use their pool the next day because he thought that was good therapy. So the police, what do they do next? They go talk to the person who owns the farm. And they say, was Chandler out here? And she goes, yeah, he was out here on the 4th of July. But you know what? He showed up the next day by himself. He showed up the next day by himself. I told him he could come back. Come back anytime, as we just say to people, not expecting they're going to roll into your house the next day. She says he was acting bizarre, said that he had a doctor's appointment, and they'd given them some bad news that he was going to lose his job at SpaceX because he couldn't travel, he couldn't attend orientation to start. And she goes, I need, he, he asked to use the pool. And of course, I said yes. This woman will testify, and she'll tell you that she sat in her house for a while, perhaps a bit weirded out that someone had just shown up at her rural farm. But she let him have his space. But about an hour later, she goes down to the pool to check on him. He's not there. No one had opened the pool. No one had been in the pool. But she sees his car. And it's parked out in the field, away from the pool, backed in toward where that grass is a bit longer, and had its hatch up. She thought, boy, that was strange. But she thought maybe he's just on a walk. So she goes in the pool. She said, I'm just going to go in the pool. If you remember that weekend, it's extraordinarily hot. She starts swimming. She says, then I see Chandler. He's walking out of the woods in that area. Now, at this point in the investigation, the police are out there with this woman. They're out on the farm. And she says he walked out over there. And you'll hear from the detective, Detective Brett Baverstock, who was out there. And he'll tell you that his eyes kind of... Need to slip in a quick break. Back after this with more of the opening statements from the prosecution. Right back. Welcome back to Court TV Live. Let's get you back into the courtroom live for more of the opening statements from the state. And I promise the photos are only going to go this far for right now. But the police walked about 20 yards into the woods. And in that pile of debris under dozens of sticks, bushes, and dirt. They found Bart Halderson. Now, when I say they found Bart Halderson, I need to explain that. They found a human torso. Someone had crudely chopped off the head, the arms, and sawed off the legs in the middle of the thigh, leaving the underwear on in the beginnings of the pants. They removed the sticks and brush over a course of a few hours. They brought out doctors from the medical examiner's office to make sure everything was done appropriately. They rolled the torso over. There were gunshots in the back. This man had been shot in the back and chopped up. At this point, the farm, a beautiful farm, all cultivated for years with wildflowers, kind of a, an Eden of sorts, 
was turned into a crime scene. Police swarmed the place. Drones were in the air, cadavers, dogs were on the ground. Everyone's looking through absolutely everything they could, but it's a farm. There's a million places things could be. But one detective said, look at that in the woods. Is that a garbage can full of a tarp? It was, and I'll tell you that tarp was taken out, taken to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab eventually. Bart Halderson, Krista Halderson, their blood is all over it. Another detective said, that spot where Chandler was walking out of the woods, there's an oil barrel there, like an old fuel tank with a hole in it. That's right where the car was parked. So she peeks her head in, and that's what she sees. Broken saw blades, hand saws, scissors, tree loppers, all of them tested by the state crime lab, all of them covered in human flesh and blood of Bart and Krista Halderson. The farm was searched extensively, and I'll tell you that some months later, things were even continuing to be found up to this fall. In October, the homeowner, the person who owns the farm, was tearing apart a barn, trying to clean it. And there in a barn about 100 yards from where Bart Halderson was found, the murder weapon, behind a bunch of boards on the side of the barn. At this point in the investigation, the police knew they needed to start talking to Chandler. He's seen coming out of the location where his dad's body was, just brutally chopped apart. The tools, the cutting instruments are found there. So they do what police do. They bring him downtown. But they ask him, and he's at the house, and they ask him and his girlfriend to come downtown with him. And they do. And that girlfriend, Kat, is in one room, and Chandler is in another. Chandler, and you'll see this, we'll play it, for over an hour meets with police, and again regurgitates this odd story of his parents with this missing couple in a random car, going places that no one really knew. Where Kat, in the other room, she's vomiting information to the police. Literally, vomiting at times, but also vomiting information in terms of she has her phone out. She's giving them pictures. She's providing every single detail she can because she'll tell you when she testifies. She's one of these people that watches these crime shows. And she knows when someone's missing, you got to exclude the people closest to them first. And she thought, that's what we got to do. Chandler didn't have anything to do with this. I didn't have anything to do with this. We got to get to the people who did. And the first step is we got to exclude us. She didn't for a second think that Mr. Halderson had done anything wrong. She thought she was with him most of the weekend. And I'll tell you right now, Kat did nothing wrong. Kat was an unknowing, unwilling accomplice to some of this, but she did absolutely nothing wrong. And she'll tell you, she liked Mr. and Mrs. Halderson. There were the normal disputes you'd have with your boyfriend or girlfriend's parents. Maybe you want to go out a lot and they don't let you. Maybe you want to hang out more than they don't want to. But she liked them. Her phone is full of messages between her and Mrs. Halderson, friendly in all respects. Kat meets with police not just once, but multiple times. And in one of these meetings, she says, you know what was weird? Is this weekend, when I was with Chandler, while his parents were at the cabin, I left the house early one day, on Saturday, in fact, Saturday, July 3rd, and she says, he told me he was going to do chores that morning around the house. But when I looked at my Snapchat, I saw his location was in a weird spot. If you don't know, on Snapchat, you can set it up so that other people can see exactly where you are. A GPS tracker on you at all times, if you will. Chandler had that set up with his girlfriend. And she goes, it was so weird where he was, I took a screenshot of it on my phone. And that's what it showed. Chandler was saved as hubby in her phone. That's perhaps a term of endearment between two folks dating in their 20s. But she said, at 8.58 in the morning, when he was supposed to be doing chores on Saturday, July 3rd, 
I thought it was strange that he was in what appears to be a forest on the banks of the Wisconsin River near Prairie du Sac. The police took that. They identified immediately where that location was, just based on looking at it. That's a bridge. Couldn't be hard. Out they go. The drones go up. The dogs go out. The search team starts searching. Very quickly, and I promise this is as far as the photos will go, they find the remains of Krista Halderson. Now, when I say Krista Halderson, I have to qualify that as well. We found her legs. One complete leg, then somewhat farther away in another bush, a foot, a thigh, but the same pattern. Crudely cut apart with appears to be hand saws, axes, things of that sort. No more of Krista Halderson that's identifiable to her will ever be found. She's just those two legs. At this point, the police thought, this is just a strange location. Why would Chandler be out there? He'd been out there before. And they started talking to people, including girlfriends of his in the past, friends of his. And they say, yeah, Chandler really liked this location out on the Wisconsin River. He'd go there all the time. It's where he'd go swimming. When his friends came into town, that was the secret swimming spot. And one friend even said, you know what? Last year, he sent me a picture while he was out there. Kind of shirtless, hanging from a tree with a machete. I don't know. Didn't have a lot of significance at the time when the police saw it. But eventually, someone realized, the tree looks unique. Interesting V pattern right there. The hollowness of the tree as it goes down. The way in which five of those branches branch off. And eventually, one of the detectives realizes why. Something clicked. It was the exact location he ditched his mother's remains. William Brown, the deputy DA in Dane County, telling the gruesome story to the jury of how the defendant's parents were found dismembered and murdered back after this. Get you back to the courtroom right where we left off. William Brown delivering the opening statement for the state of Wisconsin versus Chandler Halderson. Shouldn't come to anyone's surprise. At some point, Chandler was arrested. In fact, he was arrested on July 8th, 2021. When you're arrested for a lot of crimes, you go to jail, you get booked in, and, and not much more happens investigation-wise after that. They have what they need. But of course, that's not the case in a murder investigation, especially something like this. So Chandler's taken to jail. And the police start searching. When I say searching, you're going to hear about searches of the house, searches of this farm, searches of this property. You're going to hear about searches of landfills and ponds and ditches all across Dane County. But one of the things they started searching was, what was this guy doing on his phone that weekend? And oddly enough, most of what they found was nothing. Either Chandler hadn't Googled anything all weekend, except for the 8th, or he had deleted his search history. You'll never know. But remember, he was arrested on July 8th, taken to the police station. And that's where they told him, hey, man, we know what's going on. So meaning, while he was still on his phone on July 8th, he was still telling everyone his parents were missing, not just the police. This kid was standing in his front lawn giving media interviews to all the local media outlets about the cabin and the unknown couple and the unknown car. He was going door to door in his neighborhood. My parents are missing. Can you help me out? Do you have any security cameras, by the way? And you'll hear from these neighbors. Some of them were so weirded out by what was going on that they secretly recorded those conversations. One of them, you'll hear, was a man who'd only been retired as a detective with the city of Madison police for about a month. He recorded his conversation with Mr. Halderson. But while he's doing this that morning, what's he Googling? This is what he's Googling. Body found Wisconsin. Woman's body found Wisconsin. Wisconsin dismembered body found. 
We'll come back to the next two. Dead body found in Wisconsin. Body found in Milwaukee River. He's searching for whether they found his parents. And you'll hear in this case, he's starting to search because he's starting to get worried because the amount of police in his neighborhood has been ramping up and up and up because unbeknownst to him, they're finding his parents' remains. And you'll hear that while this is going on, while he's Googling these things, he's frantically calling police officers. Hey, why are there more cops in my neighborhood? He calls this guy, Brian Shunk. He records him. What's going on? There's more cops. Did something happen? Did you find something? The middle ones, state versus Peter Capuzzo. Probably means nothing to everyone. It meant nothing to me when I first saw it. The name rung a bell, and I wondered why. Not only did it show he Googled State versus Peter Capuzza, it showed that he clicked on a link on the Wisconsin court's website and read something. What he read was a legal case, much like this one is the State versus Chandler Halderson. The State versus Peter Capuzza, though, was a case that made it to the Court of Appeals based on some legal technicalities about a man who dismembered part of his family members and threw their bodies in the river. So at the same time Chandler Halderson is going door to door in his neighborhood, crying about his parents being missing, talking to the local news, telling sheriff's deputies, signing documents saying they're missing, he's conducting legal research to get himself out of today. So that today never happens. Now, when I started, I started with that calendar a while ago, and I said the police were initially thrown off because of one thing, and that was this text message from Krista. And it's real. I'll tell you that text message is in all the search warrant returns from US Cellular. It's on the phone that we were able to search. We're not able to search every phone, but some of them are. <laughs> Made it safely. Can't get anything through, though. Yes, it's packed. Going to White Lake today for the parade. Be home Monday night, Tuesday. Love you lots. Sent on the 4th of July. So the police started looking into that. And the first thing they found was White Lake. The parade was on July 3rd. Remember, the 4th of July this year was on a Sunday. So everyone celebrated on Saturday. So they started thinking, well, how the hell did this message get sent? So they searched the Halderson home, where Chandler was. And in the garage, under a shelf, in a shoe, wrapped in aluminum foil, was his mother's phone, along with her driver's license. Police would later subpoena the records from U.S. Cellular, the cell phone carrier that covers Chandler and the family. And they would look into what cell towers were being used when that message was sent. If you didn't know, all of you probably have cell phones. At any time, your phone is pinging off of different cell towers. It's not always the same. As you sit here, half of you might be using one tower and half of you might be using another. It's based on the workload of those towers. You'll hear about that. But it's generally an approximate area of where you are. That message on July 4th, Krista there is in pink, Chandler's in green. The message was sent from the Halderson home on July 4th. Chandler sent it to himself. So at this point, the investigators began to wonder, and perhaps you're beginning to wonder how the evidence will come out. How does this happen? How does this kid, with everything in the world going for him, promising new jobs, school, a girlfriend that loves him, willing to move across the country for him, or even physically, a kid who just suffered this major concussion, was unable to use his legs for the most part. How does this happen? And what you'll learn, it happens because none of these things are true. He wasn't going to Madison College. He wasn't studying renewable resource engineering. The people at American Family Insurance, they'd never even heard of him. There's no indication he had ever even applied for a job, much less had any job at SpaceX. The apartment he told his girlfriend he'd rented and the car he'd bought, none of that was real. 
The Madison police, they don't even have a scuba diving team. Neither does the DNR. And this concussion he apparently suffered, he did go to the hospital. And you'll hear from a doctor who was there. He said, yeah, he came in, he reported that he hit his head, falling down the stairs. I diagnosed him with a mild concussion, gave him a neck brace on the way out, told him he could use it if he needed it. But none of the things that Chandler reported to other people. Oof. Wow, what an opening. We're gonna take a break as we approach the top of the hour, back with more right after this. Top hour, welcome back to Court TV Live on our continuing coverage of the state of Wisconsin versus 23-year-old Chandler Halderson accused of dismembering and, of course, murdering his parents. The opening being delivered by William Brown from the Dane County DA's office. What you may conclude is that it was all made up. Now, police started looking into all of these lies. Because how does a person who looks so promising, was able to convince so many people of his success, how are you able to keep this up? How are you able to catfish your family, your girlfriend, your brother, your friends? And they started to find things around the Halderson home in the email accounts of Bart and Krista Halderson, in the email accounts of Chandler Halderson. When they talk about American Family Insurance, the first big lie Chandler was making up, again, the people at American Family Insurance, you'll hear them testify, they're directors of human resources. He never worked there, never worked for any of their affiliates, never worked for any of the companies that are associated with them. Chandler had been claiming to work there for a year, but he never had any money. And his father was an accountant, so his father would ask him questions pretty much daily. Why don't you have any money? Why haven't you paid any rent? And Chandler spun an amazing web of lies. First it was, well, I'm a salary guy, but they were accidentally paying me hourly, so they just held my paychecks until they fixed it. Then it was, well, I gave him the wrong direct deposit info. And then it kind of shifted eventually. And he said, well, they were gonna pay me, but now the amount is so much, they gotta pay me so much money that when they deposit it in the bank, they thought it was fake. And police started to find emails like this. This from Tom Selznick, a guy in American Family Insurance, a Northeast remote human resources guy, describing this. You're registered as salary, but you're making hourly. And these emails would go back and forth with Chandler and the HR person, and eventually he'd forward them to his father. But in the way a parent looks at their child as maybe telling the truth is not the way that you as jurors have to look at this. You, like the police, maybe have to take a more critical look at emails like this. And for one, notice, why is the guy who works at Human Resources at American Family Insurance using a Proton Mail generic email address? Why is the guy who's the Human Resources Manager spelling the word resources wrong, saying he's the Human Recourses Manager? It's, it's comically fake. He emailed himself back and forth, trying to explain why he didn't have any money, and he forwards it to his dad. Now here's where the story gets maybe a little more complex. Having a fake job solves a lot of riddles in your life. No one's hassling you to get a new job. No one's hassling you to do chores all day. But the problem is, if your dad works for home, from home, if, if he was an accountant, for instance, which he was, and which he did, you actually have to wake up early every day and go to work. So there he was. Messages between Bart and Chandler. Hey, are you up for your meetings? Yeah. Over and over again. So Chandler woke up. But he had nothing to do all day because his job was pretend. And so he sat on his computer playing video games. And I'm not against people playing video games. I'm a, a guy myself. People play video games. But video games, if you don't know, and some of you are of an age where you do, and some of you are of an age where you don't, are a much more social thing than they used to be. When you play video games, you don't just sit on Nintendo 64 and play Mario by yourself. You're playing role player games with people from around the world. And who's up early in the morning 
when Mr. Halderson had to wake up to attend his fake work meetings. People in the military who are stationed overseas. They speak English, they're American, but they're on a different time schedule. They're on him's time schedule. Most people here probably play video games at night during weekdays. But every day, Mr. Halderson was able to wake up and find a group of friends to play video games with online, one of which was stationed in Germany. This friend was a guy named Andrew Smith. Now, Mr. Smith, Mr. Halderson, became kind of best friends. They would talk all the time. They communicated in this video game all the time. And Mr. Smith, he'll testify, he's coming up here, lives down south, he's back in the US. He'll tell you that Chandler really liked an SKS rifle when they'd play some of these shooting games. It was just something he liked. Not a big deal, there's nothing wrong with that. But this past summer, about a month before the murders of Bart and Krista Halderson, this online friend, Andrew Smith, comes to visit Mr. Halderson and expect stays at the home with Bart and Krista. This is a picture of Mr. Smith in that perhaps crudely designed yellow shirt. That's Mr. Halderson. It's the only photo we have of them on that visit. You'll learn that Mr. Smith had gotten out of the military. He was done with it. But you also learn that he really likes guns. Like he really likes guns. And he knew his friend liked SKS rifles. So when he visited him, this year in June, he brought with him a gift, the SKS rifle that was found about 100 yards from Bart Halderson's body. Now, you'll meet Mr. Smith, and you'll probably concur with me after meeting him. He's not really probably a paperwork kind of guy. And so when he gave the gun to Mr. Halderson, he wanted to document that he transferred the gun, but he wasn't going to fill out any paperwork. So he just took the serial number of the gun he put Mr. Halderson's driver's license next to it and snapped a picture on his phone. There's a clear picture of that. But that serial number matches the gun found in the barn 100 yards from Bart Halderson's body. And before Mr. Smith left, he decided he would gift his friend something else, which was about 400 rounds of high-powered ammunition. Now, you'll hear from Mr. Smith despite maybe his bizarre actions and maybe his bizarre statements he may make, he's not a suspect. Police proved he was in Texas at the time all of this happened. Another unknowing accomplice to Mr. Halderson's crimes. So at this point, Mr. Halderson's working a pretend job at American Family Insurance. He's not getting paid. His father, who's an accountant, is kind of on his case about it. And he's got to figure out something else. And the best way out of your pretend job is an even more pretend job. So around May going into June of this past year, American family wasn't going well. So Mr. Halderson decided to get a new job. He's going to be an astronaut. I work at SpaceX. This is messages to his girlfriend. I have a good feeling about SpaceX. I have a follow-up interview for Florida tomorrow. Shoot, sorry, I got the job. I have training next week over the computer and leave June 11th and start June 14th. He didn't give himself a lot of time, but what he gave himself was an escape hatch. He could move. He could end the lies that he had going on in his life about being a rescue scuba diver and working for American Family Insurance by simply moving to Florida. That presented with it one major problem which was that job, which was also make-believe, would pay absolutely no better than the last job that was make-believe. So in late June, as he's supposed to start the job at SpaceX in Florida for Elon Musk, something happens in the Halderson family, something real. There's a change. Remember when I started off and I said there were two sons? His older brother gets hospitalized. That's real. It happened got diagnosed with diabetes and was having some complications. He's doing great now. Mr. Halderson uses that as an excuse to delay starting at SpaceX. It was a stroke of good luck for him, a stroke of bad luck, of course, for the family, but a stroke of good luck for him. But that only gave him a couple of weeks. 
So his brother, who's doing really well in life, engaged, house, real job, making a lot of money, suddenly he's in the hospital, being doted over by his family, by his mother. People care about him. So roughly a week later, when Chandler Halderson needs to think of a new lie to get out of the SpaceX lie, guess who ends up in the hospital, being doted over by his mother and his family with a supposed neck injury. This is Father's Day of this year, in late June. That's Bart Halderson in the middle, Mitchell on the right. And of course, Chandler wearing a neck brace that no one told him he had to wear on the left. Now, around this time, Chandler started telling people an extraordinarily bizarre set of claims. That he had a brain bleed, a hematoma, that he had spinal damage, that he needed his head drilled open, that he inability to use his legs at all. Couldn't drive. People had to do that for him. That he had nerve damage, that he needed to get a colostomy bag. But most importantly, he couldn't go to Florida. The doctors had told him he couldn't fly. Of course, that's not true. You'll see his medical records and you'll see his doctor testify. Ooh, what a story. We're not going to miss a bit of it. We're going to uh, take a quick break and get you back into the courtroom exactly where we left off right after this. Deputy DA William Brown is taking this jury on a ride and, and, and telling an unbelievable story in his opening statement. It is Wisconsin versus Chandler Halderson, the 23-year-old accused of killing and dismembering his parents. Being doted over by his family. People were making him meals. You'll see notes his mom was leaving for him. Call this neighbor if you need anything. She'll help you out. Couldn't drive, couldn't work, couldn't do chores. Now, a bit of a preview and a fast forward. This guy who's wearing a neck brace nearly every day in late June 2021 would have no problem just days later carrying large bags of ice out of gas stations to chill his father's cut up body in a freezer. And you'll note, no neck brace. And in fact, you'll note in this case, Chandler Halderson has never seen a neck brace again after July 1st, 2021 when he kills his parents. So the job lies are over for Chandler and his life. American Family Insurance, don't worry about that because he got this new job at SpaceX. In SpaceX, I can't go because I'm hurt. It was a perfect scenario. But there was one last lie that Chandler had to get out of. And that is he had told everyone he was going to MATC for college and that he was about to graduate. And you'll hear there's a hint of truth to that he was going there at one point. In fact, there's a hint of truth to all of these lies. He did go to MATC for like a semester. He failed out. But he wasn't going there anymore. And the parents were starting to grow suspicious. And we knew this because when we searched the house, we started to find notes on Bart Halderson's desk. Bart Halderson was one of these guys who prints his emails. I don't know if any of you print your emails. Uh, but some people, they get an email and they print it out. That was Bart. And we find one. It's an email between Bart and Krista, detailing a conversation that he had had with Chandler's advisors at MATC. He was supposed to meet with someone else, so we met with this guy, Daniel Spieth. Chandler's going to get a solar certificate. He wasn't. He's registered for fall classes. He wasn't. He's in the IT program. He wasn't. All of these things, line by line, none of them true. But Bart Halderson talked to this person. So police honed in on something, that line. When I talk to the advisor, he sounds just like Chaz on the phone. And he gives this number. That is, of course, because Bart Halderson, when he talked to Chandler's college advisor, was just talking to Chandler who had bought a burner phone, you know, cheap phone from like Walgreens that you can buy with no service carrier. And police know that because they searched Chandler's bedroom and in his desk drawer, they found that phone. Now this kept going. The lie about going to MATC or Madison College was the most extensive. There were emails, 
dozens, if not hundreds of emails going back and forth between supposed advisors at MATC and Chandler, and then he'd forward them to his dad from people like someone named Alyssa Brandt, 64. Sometimes Chandler would spell Brandt, B-R-A-N-D-T, sometimes just with a T and no D, depended on the day. But they all had the at Gmail address, not at madisoncollege.edu. And you'll hear from the people at Madison College, their people have real emails, they don't use Gmail. But it was over and over again. Alyssa Brandt was one of them. You heard about Daniel Spieth, also at Gmail. There was someone named Aaron Hoover, also at Gmail. In this one, Chandler's getting upset. I have to have a call with whomever's in charge within the next 30 minutes. I have been a student for over three years and I will be treated fairly. Of course, he's yelling at himself. All of these were fake. Back and forth to himself and eventually to his dad. The Halderson parents had to have been growing extraordinarily frustrated. The kid wasn't getting paid. He was injured suddenly. His college transcripts aren't coming through, so he can't get a job. So police looked at that original note again. They saw something interesting, which is in this sea of fake people, Daniel Spieth, Aaron Hoover, Tom Selznick, Alyssa Brandt, there was one name that stood out, Omar Job. And that name didn't stand out because it was fake. It stood out to the police because it was real. That is the only real person on any of these emails. And what we've discovered in this investigation is in just the day and a half prior to being murdered, Bart Halderson, Chandler's dad, called MATC and pretended to be Chandler to try to finally get some information on what's going on. Just as any of you could call any doctor and pretend to be your kid, you know their name, their social security number, their birthday, you can get through, you can get through those minor security things. Bart called MATC, said, I'm Chandler, and I want some answers. And for 17 minutes, Bart Halderson, just before his murder, talked to a man named Omar Job. Omar Job is a entry level customer service guy at MATC, he's got no skin in the game, doesn't even really remember the call, but it was recorded for customer service purposes. And Bart Halderson questions Omar, and he's very mean at first, because in his mind, he'd been getting screwed around for a year on where his son's transcripts were and what degree program he was in and why he hasn't graduated yet. But toward the end of the call, Bart asks Omar Job, hey, do any of these people work there? Alyssa Brandt, Daniel Spieth, Aaron Hoover. And he's told no, they've never worked there. And in fact, they haven't. And he says, that'll be it then. That'll be it then are the last recorded words of Bart Alderson alive. Bart Halderson, shortly after that, sends a text message. A text message that ultimately sealed his fate, which was a text to his own son. And it says, I spoke with Omar Job. Now, what happens over the next 24 or so hours is, is a bit unknown. Homicide investigations are a lot of unknowns because the two people who are the victims, who maybe know the most about what happened, they're, of course, dead. But there's not much verifiable information that happens over the next 24 hours. It's also unknown if Chandler even knew who Omar Job was. Of course, he wasn't going to MATC, so why would he know who some lowly, entry-level customer service guy was? He wouldn't. But Bart Halderson did. And when you look at Bart Halderson's work calendar that he maintains at his accounting firm, you see something quite interesting. Remember at the beginning, I said I wanted you to remember a date, a time, which was that the Haldersons were killed between 3 and 5 p.m. on J July 1st, 2021. Guess what was on Bart's calendar at that exact time? He was supposed to have a meeting with the people at MATC with his son. Wow. So supposed to this story is a doozy. What is the defense going to do? We're going to have to wait and see. We'll step aside, take a break, and we're going to get you back into the courtroom exactly where we left off right after this.
23-year-old Chandler Halderson is accused of dismembering and murdering his parents. And according to William Brown, he told a ton of lies before their deaths. Let's go back into the courtroom. Of course, that meeting couldn't happen because he wasn't going there and none of the people were real. But Bart Halderson knew that. Bart Halderson knew that. And so Chandler had obviously figured that out at this point. There was no way out of this one. You can't get out of this lie. And so the next day, Chandler Halderson wakes up on July 1st and starts messaging his girlfriend. 726, I hardly slept. 727, stuff hasn't been going well for me lately. Just trying to play. One oh four, just two hours prior to the murders. I overheard they might go to the cabin with their friends, but I don't know. So somewhat of a full circle at this point, that's the moment Chandler Halderson decides to kill his parents and engage in this bizarre story of them missing at a cabin with an unknown couple in an unknown car at 104, July 1st. Now, shortly after this message, it's about an hour and 10 minutes. Bart Alderson's getting ready to go to MATC for this meeting, perhaps to confront Chandler, perhaps Chandler's gonna confront him. Bart texts Chandler, I'm ready whenever you are. That's about 50 minutes prior to when he was killed. Those are the last words ever recorded of Bart Alderson. His phone is never used, really. Again, he dies at some point. He never goes back to work. No one ever sees him. The neighborhood he lives in, riddled with security cameras, never see him again. I'm ready whenever you are. What the evidence will show in this case is that sometime after the I'm ready whenever you are message, and probably just around three o'clock when he was supposed to go to this meeting with MATC, Bart Halderson was shot in the back multiple times with a high-powered rifle. And after shooting his dad, Chandler texts his mom. Dad's phone died. Text her, call me. And get sewed on your way home. I have an extra hour of work. You know he didn't have an extra hour of work but he was delaying her getting there because the evidence will show he needed to move things around, prepare for what he was about to do when she showed up. She responds, K, I can, smiley face. Those are the last words of Krista Halderson alive. Shortly thereafter, around just after five, neighborhood security cameras, the Haldersons didn't have one, but the neighborhood, a lot of people did, show Krista pulling in getting out of the car, walking in, she's never seen again until her legs are found out by the Wisconsin River. But just after killing his mom and his dad, the evidence in this case will show that Chandler went on his phone. If you go on your phone, I don't know if any of you have ever taken a note. You can take notes on your phone. The iPhone has an app called Notes. We got some raw data, and I've, I'll put it up here in a second. I won't put the raw data because it's a bit challenging to see. But Chandler creates a note about 5.11 that day on July 1st, probably minutes after killing his parents. And the note reads, weekend chores, H2O2 lemon. H2O2 is the chemical name for hydrogen peroxide. You'll hear from people in this case, it's essentially a household cleaner to clean up blood. Lemon, it deodorizes things. Mixed together, it's a pretty cheap cleaning product. You can have it home. So Chandler writes a note after murdering his parents, H2O2 lemon. Door handles. Just that. Spends the afternoon cleaning the house, eventually jumps in the shower. We know he's in the shower because his girlfriend and him FaceTime when they're in the shower. No, no judgment, but that's what happened and the girlfriend took a screenshot. We know he's in the shower. They say they're good nights and Chandler says, I'm going to bed, but he doesn't. He goes to gas stations. He's carrying out large bags of ice. Because what Chandler had done that night is what you all probably suspect by now. He had dismembered his parents, or at least started the process 
and had to fit them inside of freezers that were in the Halderson home. And you'll see some of these freezers, they're cleaned. But there's still some evidence around. That night, I'm not gonna show many photographs for a little bit, just because I, I think you deserve to kind of be eased into some of the things you're gonna see. That night, what appears to have happened, what the evidence will show, is Mr. Halderson took items from around the house and began cutting apart his parents. Saw blades covered in Barton Christus blood. An ax, Barton Christus blood. Hand saws, things of that sort, covered in Barton and Christus blood. He cleaned the house as best he could, and you'll hear about that. But still, blood spatter found of Barton and Christus blood around the house. And he had a plan. It wasn't a well thought out plan, but he had one. And that was he was going to burn the remains in the family fireplace there in the house. So it's July 1st, and if any of you remember, 4th of July weekend's pretty hot this year. People in the neighborhood thought it was a little bit weird that someone's fireplace was going on, they smelled stuff. One person, this neighborhood's full of retired cops, but one retired cop said, I smelled like a barbecue, like a, smelled like a pig roast. And he said that just not knowing what it was at the time, talking to the police. And that night, a neighbor who had a security camera behind the Halderson home, way far away, was able to catch something. Because it was pitch black at night, it was able to catch just a little glimpse of all the windows in the Halderson house. We have an expert that's gonna come in who works with video and light analysis. And he's gonna tell you, he was able to figure out which window that was. And the window it was that he was looking at in that camera footage that kind of just piqued his attention was the window by the fireplace. And for many hours over the course of that night, the light flickered, came on, died down, on, down. But in the early morning hours the next day, been up all night doing this. Because you'll learn, you really can't burn human remains. Your home fireplace is not gonna get hot enough to do that. It takes an extraordinary amount of heat. If you go to like a crematorium, you're inducing it with oxygen, <laughs> chemicals. Not a residential fireplace. But eventually in the middle of the night, the fire started going well. It appeared that air was being pumped into it. And you need to step aside to a quick break, back with more. We're gonna pick it up right where we left off after this. Back to the courtroom we go. William Brown, Deputy DA, Dane County, Wisconsin, delivering the opening for the state. But that light at one point grew and grew and grew and it got very bright in one room. And then all of a sudden the kitchen light came on and then all the lights went out. I don't know if anyone's ever taken a hot Pyrex plan, pan out of the, the stove and put water in it or dumped, hot, or dumped water on your hot water on your windshield on your car in the winter, but it explodes the glass. The evidence in this case will show that what happened was the fire had gotten out of control, burning these human remains. Human fat was rendering out. It was igniting. So Chandler threw water on it. But when you throw water on your residential fireplace, you break the glass. And that's exactly what happened. Just above that broken glass panel, which is clearly shattered, you see the paint kind of bubbled off from the heat. This is in the search of the home some week later. Fireplace is clearly used. The police noticed something interesting about this photograph, which is despite being clearly used, the fire, the logs are rebuilt. Someone had cleaned out all the ashes and rebuilt it. Clean logs, newspaper, one burnt piece in the middle. But what stuck out to police right away was that little rock right there. They thought, what is that? You'll hear from the people who collected this evidence. You'll hear from an arson specialist from the Department of Justice, a guy named Bill Boswell, who'll come in. You'll hear from a forensic anthropologist, a doctor named Christina Figueroa Soto, who will tell you, we were all interested in what that was, because it was out of place. 
So they pulled it off and they put it on one of these fancy police deals. And the forensic anthropologist took one look at it and she said, oh, this is a human skull. He had burned his parents' heads in that fireplace. Later, the police would go through the ash trap of that fireplace and they would find human remains, facial bones, the knee bones, which because we found Krista's legs by deduction had to be barred, all in the ash trap of that fireplace. They were all cataloged. Now, burnt remains can't be tested for DNA. There's no biological material left, but they're able to tell it's human based on the structure of the bone. And you'll hear from the anthropologist who will talk about that. So that's what happened on July 1st. Now, you're going to hear about all of those days in between Barton, Krista dying at 3 o'clock on the 1st, all the way through the police report. But to summarize, Chandler stayed up all night that night of the 1st. Obviously, things weren't going well, burning his parents' remains. So the next day, perhaps not having slept, he walked into Fleet Farm at 7.21 a.m. to buy a tarp. He's on video. He knew his girlfriend was spending the night that night, so he spent the whole day cleaning. But he's sending her text messages, which you will see throughout the day, asking her to bring him hydrogen peroxide and a mop, because he still needed to clean up. The next day, Saturday, July 3rd, 2021, his girlfriend leaves early in the morning. That's the day she snaps that picture of him out by the Wisconsin River dumping off his mom's remains. He spends the rest of the day hanging out. But when he goes home and says he's going to bed that night, this young man who supposedly couldn't drive or carry heavy objects, his phone records show that he's up near the Wisconsin River in Portage. As if you're driving the interstate up to the Dells, right when you cross the Wisconsin River, off in the state land there to the right. For about an hour in the middle of the night, the police tried to search that area. It was impossible with the currents. Whatever remains were thrown in there are lost forever. July 4th, 2021, <clears throat> this is the day he texts himself, spends the day with his girlfriend's family, goes to their farm to use the pool. That's the day he says, hey, can I come back tomorrow? Goes to some fireworks. He's living a normal life. No mention of his parents. The next day, takes out the garbage in the morning. Who knows what was in that garbage can? We've thoroughly searched the landfills, but it's impossible to find anything. But he took out the garbage. He goes out to the farm to supposedly use the pool where he's seen walking out of the woods. Cell phone tower records prove that he was out there on the farm. Remember I told you he told that person that he was having trouble at work and school and, and, and having a bad doctor's appointment. He never went to any doctor's appointment that day. Phone records show he never talked to any doctor. It was all a ruse to be able to go out in the woods and hide his father's body. The next day, not much happens because Chandler was up all night. Again, that light analysis shows all night, the garage light on and off. The garage, of course, being where we found some of these tools, the ax covered in blood. He's cleaning up. At 4.30 in the morning, for no apparent reason, he drives around the city of Madison. There's no idea what he did there. But he's not doing much. But be people begin questioning him about his parents. He just says they're late. The person most worried, perhaps, is his girlfriend. She thought that was unlike them. The next day, he drives back to the farm, throws a bag of bloody rags into their garbage can that's out by the street. And at 11.22, he texts his girlfriend that he's finally going to the police. We know that the bag of rags came from his house because they were in the Target bag his girlfriend picked up from Target. And she did the curbside pickup. So her name was printed on the outside. It was when she brought him hydrogen peroxide. He filled the bag with bloody rags and left it at the house. The next day, he starts Googling body found, Wisconsin dismembered body found. He's walking door to door, asking about security cameras in his neighborhood. And at 4 p.m., they take him downtown and they arrest him at 641. So that's the story. That's why you're here for a couple weeks. Like I said in the beginning, a lot of cases end with the murder. This one, it's just a small piece of the puzzle. 
None of the things that happen after and none of the things happened before make any sense without knowing the murder happened on a specific day at a specific time. But the evidence in this case you'll find is overwhelming. Chandler Halderson killed his parents on July 1st, 2021. He cut up their bodies with axes and saws and knives. And he didn't even give them the dignity of having a funeral or even a final resting place in one piece or together. Their remains were scattered across Dane County, in public land, on farms, in garbage cans, in the rivers, and perhaps every ditch is a possibility in this county. You'll find the evidence in this case is overwhelming. Now, over the next couple of weeks, I'll make you a couple promises as your prosecutor in this case. I'm not here to waste your time. But of all the constitutional rights we talked about of Chandler, he has them. I want you to respect them. There's another one that you should know, which is this is the only time we get to have this trial. You get one trial in the United States of America, and I have to do it right. So if that means calling a lot of witnesses, I apologize in advance. If it means calling experts to say things that maybe you already know, I apologize in advance. But I'm going to do my job right as your prosecutor. Second, you're going to see terrible photographs. There were approximately 5,000 photographs taken in this case. You're going to see maybe total a couple hundred of actual body parts, maybe a couple dozen. We have scoured those photographs and tried to remove ones that are just horrible to see because of the conditions the bodies were in, because of insects and maggots and things of that sort, and instead are trying to only show you photographs that help you understand how the remains were hidden, where they were hidden, how they were dismembered. To the extent possible, we're using cleaner photographs that were taken by the Dane County Medical Examiner. I promise you, I'm not trying to pull on anyone's heartstrings. I'm not trying to make this overly emotional. You might feel emotional. I suspect many of you have never seen anything like what you're going to see in the next couple of weeks. But I promise to do my best to limit the amount. And lastly, I promise to just ask questions, a lot of questions because you're the jury in this case, and you deserve to hear absolutely everything. It will be a struggle. You'll get sick of walking back and forth to these jury rooms. You might get sick of each other. I hope not. But it's an important task. What happened here shouldn't happen, but it did. And so in a couple weeks when I stand up here and Ms. Raymond stands up here, I'm gonna ask you to deliver a verdict of guilty, to finally bring some much-needed truth to Chandler Halderson. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Brown. Counsel. William Brown, with uh, an extraordinary opening statement. We're going to step aside, take a break. We'll hear from the defense when we return.